All righty. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Rick Hess, Director of Education Policy Studies here at AEI. Uh, delighted to have you with us today for Lessons from Success, a keynote and conversation with Eva Moskowitz. Uh, the event hashtag, uh, especially for those of you watching online, is Education of Eva. Uh, cap both E's, cap uh, capital E in Education, of Eva, capital E. Uh, live event is of course being live streamed and full video will be posted after we conclude. Uh, I suspect uh, that Eva Moskowitz needs little by way of introduction in this room. She is the founder and CEO of Success Academy Charter Schools. Success Academy Charter Schools uh, is arguably the highest performing uh, public charter school network in the United States. Uh, the schools won the 2017 Broad Prize for Public Charter Schooling. Uh, full disclosure, I was a member of the selection committee, and I can uh, testify that one of the conversations was, why is it that the success results look so remarkable, and how confident can we be that these are accurate because they're so darn impressive? That's a good problem to have when you're in the education business. Uh, in a 2017 study, uh, Credo at Stanford University found that on average, uh, success uh, students achieved uh, 228 days worth of math gains and 120 more days worth of reading gains compared to district school students with similar demographics. Uh, since opening its first school in Harlem in 2006, success has grown to uh, 46 schools serving more than 15,000 students across New York. Uh, Eva Moskowitz herself is a former New York City Council member uh, who I first got to meet years and years ago when she was holding an endless series of fascinating hearings uh, on the New York City Department of Education as chair of the City Council's Education Committee. Uh, I think Eva Moskowitz uh, probably can take personal responsibility for so many of the conversations today around collective bargaining, rubber rooms, and so much else that had sneaked its way into contracts that most of us just didn't know about. Uh, Eva holds a PhD in American history from Johns Hopkins uh, and was a history professor at schools including the University of Virginia and Vanderbilt uh, before getting roped into uh, duty as the uh, founding CEO of Success. Uh, delighted to have her here with us today. The way it's going to work is I'm going to turn the mic over to Eva. Uh, she'll talk with us for a little while. Uh, then we'll have a chance to sit down and uh, talk about a few of the things that come out of her new book. The Education of Eva Moskowitz, just out a couple weeks ago. If you haven't had a chance to pick it up, it's a terrific read. I would strongly encourage it. Um, and then we'll open it up uh, to conversation with the audience. With that, Eva, let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rick, and uh, thank you for coming. It's nice uh, to be here and have this opportunity to talk to you about a subject that has been, I won't even say my passion, but really obsession uh, for more than uh, a couple of decades now. Uh, but I wanted to start just by uh, asking you a few questions before we get into the heart of the matter. Um, how many of you went to public school? A good, good number of you, I did as well. Uh, how many of you, think back to your elementary, how many of you went to a public school where more than 60% of the kids could not read? Did anyone here go to such a school? By the way, I did. I went to such a school. And it's not something that one should be proud of or not, but I think it does indicate that there's sometimes a disconnect between our own experience and potentially the public policies that we embrace. Um, many, many kids in urban areas go to elementary schools where more than 60% of the kids cannot read. And we know what their futures uh, will be if they're in uh, such a situation. The first school, I attended was PS 36, an elementary school in Harlem. In 2016, 18% of the students at PS 36 could read. Uh, among African Americans, uh, that rate was only 10%. So 
So 90% of the African Americans going to the school that I went to as an elementary school student could not uh, read. It's that early experience that started me on a path to a different public policy uh, conclusion. And I thought I would do a brief reading uh, from the book in case you don't get a chance. Uh, I didn't go to sleep one night believing in traditional public schools and wake up the next mor morning believing in charters. Rather, my views on school choice evolved gradually from profound skepticism to open-mindedness to cautious support and were the product of decades of experience with the public schools as a student and then as an elected official. At the very first school I attended, PS 36 in Harlem, I saw just how poorly some students were being educated. Though my work with Cambodian refugees, through my work with Cambodian refugees in high school, I saw that good public education was largely reserved for those who could afford expensive housing. As a council member, I increasingly came to understand how the public school system's design contributed to segregation and inequality. While it won't come as news to most readers of this book that schools in poor communities tend to be worse, understand that there is a difference between reading about this in the newspaper or a book and coming face to face with a mother who is desperate because she knows her son isn't learning anything at the failing school he is attending. Understand that there's a difference between knowing in the abstract that there are schools at which 5% of the children are reading proficiently and actually visiting such a school and seeing hundreds of children who are just as precious to their parents as mine are to me but who you know won't have a fair chance in life because of the inadequate education they are receiving. First-hand experiences like this cause you to re-examine your views carefully to make absolutely certain they aren't based on faulty assumptions or prejudices or wishful thinking. As a council member, I'd also become increasingly aware of the school system's dysfunction. In the book, I've recounted some of what I saw. Textbooks that arrived halfway through the school year, construction mishaps, forcing pers prospective teachers to waste half a day getting fingerprinted. Know, however, that these are just a few select examples of a mountain of evidence that came to my attention from 100 hearings, 300 school visits, and thousands of parent complaints that came to me as chair of the Education Committee. Interviewing principal superintendents and teachers helped me understand just how impossible it was for them to succeed given the labor contracts and how job protections created a vicious cycle. Teachers felt they'd been dealt an impossible hand their principal was incompetent, or the students were already woefully behind, or their textbooks hadn't arrived, or all of the above. They didn't feel they should be held accountable for failing to do the impossible, so they understandably wanted job protections. However, since these job protections made success even harder to achieve for the principals who were already struggling with other aspects of the system's dysfunctionality, they too wanted job protections. Nobody wanted to be held accountable in a dysfunctional system, but the system couldn't be cured of its dysfunction until everyone was held accountable. In order to have any chance of fixing this system, I came to believe we needed to radically change the labor contracts. The teachers union contract had expired in May 2003 and was being renegotiated. I held hearings on the teachers union contracts and I hoped that these hearings would contribute to real changes in that contract. Throughout 2003 and 2004, the city held firm, refusing to sign a contract that preserved, quote, 
lockstep, lockstep pay, seniority, and life tenure, which Chancellor Joel Klein had said were, quote, handcuffs that prevented him from properly managing the system. In June of 2005, however, the UFT brought 20,000 teachers to rally at Madison Square Garden, where Randy Weingarten demanded a new contract and Bloomberg's prospective Democratic opponents in the upcoming mayoral election spoke. The message was obvious. Sign a new contract or we'll back your Democratic opponent. In October, the city capitulated, signing a new contract with none of the fundamental reforms sought by Klein. The development accelerated a shift in my views on public education. If even somebody as powerful and committed as Bloomberg couldn't make fundamental reforms, I didn't see how anybody else could. One columnist had observed, if not now, when? If not Bloomberg, who? The answers to those questions I reluctantly concluded were never and nobody. This led me to take more seriously the arguments that we'd be better off if public education were principally provided by charter schools that were freed from the labor contracts, politics, and the stifling bureaucracy that plagued the district schools. I also wasn't persuaded by the arguments against charters that they wouldn't be, quote, accountable because they weren't government run, which struck me as weak given that the government's abysmal record running district schools and that, camp and that parents couldn't be trusted to choose schools wisely, which was contrary to my experience, that parents were in fact critical educational consumers. The most baffling argument of all was that a district school system ensured equality since everybody was educated in the same system. In reality, the district system was rife with inequality. I came to understand that people who believe this argument weren't comparing charter schools to the public school system that actually existed, but rather to their theoretical ideal. They imagined a system that was integrated and fair, in which every child got an adequate education, in which class size was small, and every teacher was brilliant and nurturing. While it's admirable to aspire to these things, children attend school in the real world. And it's unwise to reject charter schools in favor of an ideal unless there's a good reason to believe that the ideal is truly achievable. I'd come to believe it wasn't. So my journey to school choice did not come from reading Milton Friedman. I just want to make that clear. Um, I come from a liberal democratic household my commitment was to social justice and equity, and I was reluctant to come to this position. But as I uh, had experience with the school system, I have gone to hundreds of schools where more than 60% of the kids in elementary school do not read. I came to feel that parent choice was an absolute uh, non-negotiable. So the book is in part about that journey of how I came to that conclusion, but it's also about the history of success. And last year, we had 17,000 parents uh, apply in our random lottery set of schools, and unfortunately, we only had room for 3,000. And the 28,000, meaning the 14,000 kids times two, the 28,000 parents who we sent home empty-handed, they love their kids just as much as the 6,000 parents that get to send uh, their kids uh, to our schools. When I started, uh, we started with 165 kindergartners and first graders. Uh, we now are serving 15,500 kids across 46 campuses. We are the seventh largest school district in the state of New York, and we are number one in terms of student achievement. How have we done this? Of course, the answer is complex, and it would take me a few hours to uh, go over that, but I thought I would, as I lay out in the book, uh, make 
uh, four or five uh, guiding principles that I think have led uh, to our success. Um, one foundational principle is that we believe at success that while education is for the children, that is the orientation, the end goal, it's actually, the, its quality is about the adults. It's about whether the adults are promoting thinking, mathematical reasoning. It is the adults' understanding of the poem or the math problem or the piece of writing that makes the difference in whether the kids are learning at a high level. We believe at success that content matters. A content does not teach children, but if you don't have a good question to ask children, you will not get children to give you interesting answers. You will not have them uh, engage in critical and creative thinking. And when I started success, I thought that the content existed, that you just call up the publishing companies and, you know, they're gazillions of them, and they're making hundreds of millions of dollars, so they must have math problems that I would want to teach. And I found that they didn't, uh, and they don't, and I don't know how they make all that money, because the math problems are not very good. Uh, and so I began a journey of developing intellectual property, which I would much prefer not to have done, uh, but it was the only way I could ensure that my kids got access to really good, smart questions and problems. And just so you know, I have begun the process of putting that online for any educator around the world uh, who wants it. So we, uh, we put our K-4 literacy curriculum, and we will try and put the rest as fast as we can. Uh, I believe that management matters. I have never seen a high-performance organization where management doesn't matter. I think it's very, very key to the quality of education. Um, I believe that uh, teachers need to function, the whole school needs to function at, as, at, as one team. And I'm sort of amazed by a school that has one teacher who believes in progressive pedagogy, another teacher who believes in direct instruction. That is very, a very hard school to run. Uh, we at Success believe in progressive pedagogy, and if teachers don't believe in that, then it wouldn't work very well. And so we're not sort of managing against philosophical differences. We have a philosophical point of view. It doesn't mean we're right. It simply means that we have a point of view, and we're very explicit. Anyone who wants to work as an educator needs to believe in progressive pedagogy, otherwise you're gonna have underlying conflicts. Um, we believe in an enormous amount of teacher and leader training. Uh, our teachers and leaders get more than 13 weeks of training every single uh, year. Uh, and we believe that principals need to be instructional leaders. So we try and take away uh, and have other people do the jobs uh, that are not instruction uh, and have a business manager, a, a data manager person, so that the principal can truly be the instructional uh, leader uh, of the school. So those are the few of the insights I've learned uh, over the past 12 years, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. That was terrific. Good. Um, look, let's start. You just characterized, uh, you know, Success Academy schools as student-centered progressive instruction. But I think when most people think about them, they think about really high test scores. Uh, they think about the fact that you are frequently criticized by folks in New York City Department of Education or schools of education who see themselves as champions of progressive pedagogy. What's going on? Well, a lot of the critics haven't actually been in the schools, so they are kind of making uh, kind of assumptions. 
Um, we designed Success Academy. Uh, we believe the fundamental goal of school, and again, I'm not imposing my values on others. I'm just saying these are our values. We believe the purpose of school is to teach kids to think critically and creatively. So across content areas, that is our premise, that is our goal. Uh, and we have designed curriculum that is designed to have as little teacher talk as possible and as much learning by doing. And so if I see um, teachers talking incessantly and the kids are not, the person doing the talking is often doing the thinking. And so we really have a great deal of emphasis on the kids solving problems. Uh, and those problems can be in mathematics, they can be in science, or they can be a critical question about the meaning of a poem. Now, the funny thing is, right, I mean, this sounds so familiar. Lots of educators and district schools and charter schools will say this. We want the kids thinking, we want the kids engaged. Why is it so hard to do in so many places? And what seems to be responsible for you guys having so much success at this? Well, first of all, it is really hard, and we don't find it easy. Uh, you know, you can believe in progressive pedagogy, but when kids start doing backwards somersault flips, you resort to your direct instruction. Uh, you know, teachers like control, and it feels better to be doing the talking. It gets really messy when the kids are doing the thinking, and you have to, you know, manage this group of students who are thinking about the problem at this level, but another group of students is thinking about it not in quite a sophisticated way. It is really challenging to do progressive pedagogy. It's much harder, I would argue, to do progressive pedagogy well than it is to do traditional pedagogy uh, well. Uh, but I believe that if you acculturate everyone to those values, uh, and you manage, and you have curriculum that is thinking curriculum, and, and many, many curriculums are not. Uh, I mean, I, I've been a little bit horrified as a relative newcomer. Uh, I looked at mathematics, for example, and it's really math by card tricks. Uh, they have so many steps. They take the thinking work out of it so that the kid doesn't have to think. In fact, it's prohibited from thinking because they outline the steps. So if you're a teacher and you're using that curriculum, it would be really hard to be a progressive pedagogue because you've been told by the district, here's your textbook. Here's what you're supposed to use. So you either have to ignore the district and create your own materials, which, by the way, is not so easy to do, um, I think that's why we've ended up where we are. I do think many educators would prefer progressive pedagogy, but if you don't have the curriculum and you don't have a lot of support, it's hard to, it takes a lot of self-discipline as a teacher to not be what I call a trial lawyer. I hope none of you are trial lawyers. I'm not against you, but it's not good to lead the witness if you're a teacher. You want the kid to discover the answer with the least amount of support possible. And that takes a lot of self-control and self-discipline to do that. And we have to teach educators to do that. And we're not investing in the kind of professional development that would lead to good progressive pedagogy. That's a very long-winded no, answer. No. So, I mean, I mean, I think this is part of what, at least for me, and I think so many other folks are interested in, is what are the moving parts that make schools work for kids, especially kids who've not been well served previously in their schools. So how do you go about figuring out which mathematics curricula, with which mathematics problem, how do you figure out which teachers and how to support and train these teachers to do the kinds of stuff that you just talked about? Well, um, on math, I mean, first you have to realize there's a problem and I, I learned sort of the hard way uh, I thought the publishing companies were not what I think of them now. I won't go there, but I sort of thought, I met with all these sales reps and I looked at the curriculum and I, I couldn't frankly believe what I was seeing. 
uh, and I was fortunate to sort of scour the country. Uh, Steve Lewand is here, who was a tremendous help uh, to success, uh, to help us find better questions to ask and uh, really learn how to be uh, more progressive. Uh, I remember Steve saying, just ask the kids, why and how do you know? And even that will be uh, a giant leap forward. And if you walk into any success academy all day long, every hour of every day, a teacher is saying, why, how do you know? And what do you think of what she said? And you kind of, you know, if you teach people how to ask good questions and not tell kids the answers, you can generate an awful lot of learning. But we also have to really support our principals. I think teacher training is more well known as a solution than principal training. I, I still think being a principal is the hardest job in America. I did it for three years and it almost killed me. It's, it's exhausting. I mean, not only are you dealing with um, the instruction, but you've got kids who are homeless and are coming from domestic violence shelters and the list of kind of social ills that one can deal with on any given day is just emotionally very, very overwhelming. So we really do a lot to support our principals. Um, what do you do when you have a kid who's having a psychiatric uh, breakdown? How do you provide the level of support for that principal and that kid and that family to get the kid and the family the help that they need? Um, we've built a kind of alternative district, um, which is not bureaucratic, which is highly, highly responsive to our principles, and I think that's one of the secrets of our success. Hmm. So let's talk about a couple uh, of other kind of pieces of, of this puzzle. You talked about, the, the way you said it was, you know, teachers and schools need to function as a team. Mm -hmm. One of the things that drives, you know, a lot of teachers crazy is just the kinds of dysfunction that gnaw at them. Problems that don't get solved, supplies that don't show up, uh, you know, lights that won't turn on. You talk in the book about trying to deal with this in a way that makes teachers feel supported and respected. How do you get that going and how do you, how do you get everybody in an organization to actually do that the way you want them to when there's so many bad habits that can sneak in? Well, I think it's getting it right from the get-go. So, uh, you know, take something like the aesthetics of the building and the maintenance of the building. Uh, you know, I think one thing that happens is that the buildings get dilapidated and something gets broken, it never gets fixed, and then uh, it's really hard for people to be invested in um, the maintenance as it deteriorates. So uh, when teachers walk in on uh, our teacher start in the summer, because we have a longer school year and school day and all this training, um, the building is freshly painted, and uh, the rugs are cleaned, uh, and the place looks nice, and then we talk about what our operational values are. And our operational values are not only that we want a smooth, smoothly running and efficient uh, school, uh, from arrival to dismissal to the lunchroom uh, to uh, transitions from class to class, um, but we want you, there's a very particular system if uh, your shade is broken or the light bulb goes out and you as the teacher should expect that fixed in 24 hours. And when you create that kind of culture where you have very, very high expectations on the operational side, um, it's easier, frankly, to maintain because everybody's invested in uh, the beauty and maintenance of the building. And ultimately, we say to people, it's, it's partly about your working conditions, but it's also we want the building beautiful for the kids. We want it to feel like a house of learning, like the kinds of activity that go on in our school building are really, really important. And it should be beautiful and nice. Not as beautiful and nice as this, but nonetheless, um, uh, beautiful and nice. And so people get invested in the upkeep in the building because when they came to it was nice. They get their, uh, we have operational ticketing system, so the teacher sends an email. 
Uh, and then we manage the custodial, and custodial staff to make sure that the light bulb is now, how, how do you afford this? Do you have to hire extra custodians, or what do you do differently? to make sure this happens? Yeah, we, we get less money than the district schools, uh, considerably less money. Uh, recently, uh, we had a, a pretty serious policy defeat, and we're now at 58 cents on the dollar to the district school in New York. Uh, and we're educating kids a uh, much longer, uh, longer day and, and longer year. Uh, so it's not, it's not the money. It goes back to the management. Um, we really we manage very, very closely. And I think this has been underestimated in public education management, uh, and it really is very important to the, the model. Uh, how do you manage a school building so that when lights go out, they're fixed? Uh, when, uh, you know, when paint is chipped, it gets repainted in you know, a normal length of time. Uh, we, we manage the heck out of all systems related to schooling. Now, one of the things you talk about in the book is I think you call them the cultural indicators, maybe. Some of the metrics you use. You, you, you point out that schools, charters, district schools are very data-driven nowadays, but that data tends to be test-based. And you talk about some of the other kinds of indicators that you focus on. Could you talk about what some of those indicators are and how you use them as part of this management strategy? Well. You know, if a kid isn't in school, it's hard to educate him or her. And so attendance becomes a general reflection of the tight management of the school. If you can't even get the kids to school, uh, the school can't be terribly managed. It also might be that school is not a place where kids and families want to be. Um, and we try and make school the most engaging, enjoyable experience possible for kids uh, so that uh, it requires less management on the attendance because kids want to come there. We, we, you know, you've recently read, I'm sure, about the teacher absenteeism. Our teachers want to be there. They want to see their kids and they want to see what uh, a discussion of poetry or a mathematical problem is going to be. It's much more interesting, by the way, for the adults to do progressive pedagogy their level of engagement is much, much higher because it's more interesting for them as well as uh, for the kids. But we manage data very uh, closely. It's attendance. It's um, getting to school on time. Sometimes it's academic. Uh, we believe kids should know how to spell. I, I think we're one of the few people left uh, who believe in spelling, uh, but we, you know, that would be a data point. Uh, we, whatever activity we want the kids to do, if we can measure it, we believe in measuring it. So, you know, our kids learn to type in second grade and we know how many words per minute they can type. Um, we believe when it's possible that we should measure things and that we should hold people accountable for the results. Mm. You know, when you talk about the, the progressive philosophy of the school, you know, a lot of progressive educators get frustrated by standardized assessments. They say, look, those are not a, a good mirror for what we're trying to accomplish with our kids. You've always kind of talked about testing differently. Uh, how, how do you kind of reconcile the, the goals of child-centered progressive education and the role of standardized testing? And how, how does success fare so well on these tests, given that you're using instruction which isn't necessarily geared to them? Well, a couple of things. I think sort of anti-testing folks, I mean, you can be reductionist on any end of the spectrum, but I think uh, many anti-testing folks assume that if a test is multiple choice, then it's non-thinking. And that is not necessarily the case. Uh, you can have a well-designed test, which actually is testing thinking. I think if you look at the new SAT, for example, it's quite good. Uh, they're asking kids to read real literature and answer thoughtful questions. Uh, it's not the old SAT, which was a sort of more gameable uh, type of test. You can ask uh, kids to engage in deep mathematical reasoning and have four choices for what the answer is. So I, I, I think there can be a way in which testing can be reduced, but I don't 
I would never want a system where uh, state tests or any kind of tests were the only measure of quality, first because I believe so deeply in the non-academic sub subjects. I mean, to me, a great school has to have art, music, in our case, chess, debate, coding, dance, uh, et cetera. Um, How much time do kids spend in those subjects, those activities at success? Uh, somewhere between two and three hours a day. Depending on, you know, if a kid is in academic intervention, then they get a little less because uh, we need to use that time for added support. Um, and it differs a little bit. We do electives in third grade, uh, and so it goes up there. Uh, but somewhere between two and three hours a day. Um, I don't see them, I don't, to go back to the testing, I don't see it as conf um, conflicted. I also don't think it's pragmatic. Like if you're anti-testing, what are you gonna do when, you, when the kid gets to the SATs? You're gonna opt out, okay. There are some colleges that allow you to do that, but most, um, most poor kids, by the way, do not have that option because most poor kids have to get money. And in order to get money, you have to do really well on standardized tests. And so I don't think it's fair for poor kids to not prepare them for the world that exists. But I also don't think it should take over the whole curriculum. And if you're educating kids really, really well, then preparing them for the test is not some monumental task. Uh, part of the reason, and, and just so you understand, our kids are not just passing these tests. We had 31% of our kids get the highest score of four in ELA, and 71% of our kids got the highest score of math in math. The only way to get 71% of a non-selective population to get the highest score of four is if you teach them mathematical reasoning. Uh, because um, the kids uh, are approaching those tests first by estimating the answer. Estimation is one of the most powerful thinking mechanisms. Um, also, kids are double checking and they are solving the problem uh, using multiple strategies. Um, kids can't do that with two weeks of preparation. The reason our kids can use multiple strategies is that's what they do every single day in their curriculum. Not only did they use multiple strategies, but in our classrooms, if Rick and I are students, I'm expected to be able to comment on your mathematical strategies. Like, what am I noticing that you did? And you have to be able to do the same um, for us, our math curriculum looks a little like art criticism. You know, that's sort of, kind of, that's the normal way um, we, we go about things. And so I don't, I don't think they're in tension. Mm. You know, one of the things you talk about in the book, which most folks seem to refer to Duck, is how you interact with parents, how you set expectations for parents, and in particular, what happens with parents aren't stepping up in the way that you guys think they need to step up in partnership. Could you talk a little bit about the success philosophy there and what do you do if parents aren't doing what you all think they need to? Well, when I opened uh, Har Harlem One, which was our first school, I had this notion that I think my board was very skeptical of that I was gonna ask parents to read to their kids. Uh, 15 minutes a night, it was kindergarten and first grade. And people said, well, how are you gonna make them do that? Um, and I said, I don't know, it's good for children. We have to have parents reading uh, to kids. And uh, if parents are illiterate or non-native speakers of English, then we have to get them to read in their native language. Or we have to get the equivalent, Audible didn't exist when we started, but at the beginning, I used books on tape. Um, and when, you know, the first two weeks, I had 37%, it kind of stuck in my mind all these years, 12 years ago, 37% of our parents did what I asked them to do. And I thought, uh-oh, maybe my board was right. Maybe this is sort of an impossible thing. And 
you know, uh, people said to me, are you going to impose your middle class values on um, parents? And I said, well, I don't know what kind of values they are. All I know is that we need parents to read to kids, not even so much for the reading, but it's about bonding over books and what that signifies to kids um, and parents. And so, you know, I called on my parents together. Not everyone showed up. And then I called the ones who didn't show up. And I again said, you know, this is not going to work unless we develop a strong reading culture. And I need you to read 15 minutes a night to your kids. And, you know, it inched up to 55%, and I didn't give up. And it was around mid-November that I had 99% of my families. I had to do one-on-one -on -one meetings. I kept narrowing the number of parents who were not um, reading, and not in an aggressive way, but you know, really just explaining what it was going to take uh, to get our kids where we needed to go. I often say to our parents, uh, when they feel that you know there's too much homework and and so forth, I I say, well, you know, you can curse me in the bathroom with the door locked, not in front of your children, if you want to, because I am the chief architect, and you can blame me for the rigor. But you not, might consider blaming China and India, because I'm not the one who has set the competitive global economy. I don't have that level of control. It's a competitive world out there, and if we're going to get your kids into college and to graduate in four years, they're going to have to be really well educated, and affluent parents are reading to their kids. And so we've got to level that playing field, and I'm going to provide the books, and if you don't read or are not a native speaker of English, then we're going to provide these additional supports. And I have found that you know, you can really take advantage of the mama bear or papa bear instinct. Our parents love their kids. They want the absolute best. Um, but, you know, they may not have made time for this critical activity, given that most of our parents don't have childcare and may have multiple jobs. It is hard, and so we have to make it as easy as possible and inspire our parents um, to do the kind of work it's going to take to get where we want to go. Hmm. Well, you know, one of the, let's make this the last question, then we'll open it up uh, for a conversation. One of the critiques of success has been like, has been that these rigorous elements that you've talked about, the demands on parents, the homework, the expectations on kids, have dissuaded um, some families from wanting to participate and have, in fact, cream skimmed, and that that's what's responsible for success working. H how do you think about that? How do you answer the concerns that you're not really helping a broad set of families in need, that you're cream skimming the kids that you're working with? Well, we accept by random lottery, uh, and we do tremendous outreach. So you can't live in the neighborhoods. We get criticized for that, too. You kind of can't win. If you go out and you tell everyone about your school, then you're somehow marketing. But if you don't tell everyone about your school, then you're an elitist. I mean, it's sort of hard <laughs> to know. Um, but we choose access. Access is really, really important to me and the sort of level playing field. So we do tremendous access. Um, some parents actually would call it harassment. Um, we really pound the pavement. Um, we run our outreach uh, the way I used to run my campaigns, which was to go door to door and, you know, uh, have a field operation. That's sort of how we, we do it. So if we open up a school and, you know, uh, beds die, you can't go 10 feet to the right or the left without knowing about Success Academy being an option. Um, so that's one way uh, we, uh, you know, guarantee uh, as much as we can that people put their names in the lottery. Um, once families get in, uh, we also have a highly, highly customer service operation to help parents um, 
you know, get the uniform and fill out the 26 forms that government requires. It really is a logistical feat, if you can imagine that we have to collect 26 forms from every family um, uh, in order to... Uh, and is that literal, 26 forms? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's state and city, and there's some federal stuff. There's just a lot of forms uh, in general in educating children. Um, so we, we have a highly customer service operation in order to support families even after they win the lottery. Uh, and we go through, you know, we go to a lot of trouble. Uh, every parent has the cell phone number of every t teacher, every principal, my husband hates this, but 15,500 parents have my cell phone. Uh, and I, I ask them not to call me about their child's left sneaker, if at all possible, because I have no idea where the left sneaker is. Um, but it's part of our customer service if a parent has a complaint. Uh, How and many they, calls and texts do you get a day? Oh, I get quite a few. My staff doesn't. And I answer them myself. They don't like that either. But um, I, like to, I like to know if there's a problem. I, I like people to have access. Um, to me, I think that's sort of a more customer-friendly way of going about it. Obviously, I have a large staff to kind of handle the problems. I don't want you to think that I'm uh, dealing with every problem myself. Um, but the, the other thing to understand is that we have incredibly high uh, student retention rates, much higher than the district and much higher than our co-located schools. So it's mathematically impossible to get the results that we are getting um, by quote unquote creaming. That just, uh, and I think I, I did the math in the book just to sketch it out for you because it's been such a sort of myth that has been uh, promoted. Mm. All right, let's go ahead and open this up. Uh, Grant and Connor have got mics. Please catch their eye. Uh, I'm gonna ask folks uh, to be kind enough to identify yourself by name and affiliation, uh, and to actually ask a question. If we get 15 seconds in and I don't see a question coming, we'll give somebody else a chance. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Robert Doerr from AEI, and I, I spent seven years working for Mayor Bloomberg at the Human Resources Administration, and I've always admired you from afar, Eva. Thank you. So thank you for your great contribution to our city. Uh, my question is, uh, your book, which, by the way, Rick gave me on Friday, and I, I read over the weekend, and is really an outstanding book about the city of New York, um, goes to great length to describe how difficult it was for you to do this simply good thing, help educate poor kids in New York. And some of that opposition came from people who, as, a, as a, someone who grew up in a liberal democratic family, thought might be on your side. And they weren't. And I wondered whether you are making any progress with them, and do you see any hope? <laughs> and then the other thing is, there's a lot about elementary and middle school. What's happening with high schools, and, and what, where do you see outcomes for your kids after they graduate? Sure, well, on the topic of progress, um, you know, there are days where it seems like a little progress, and then there's a, a step uh, backwards. Um, look, I think people are very nostalgic about um, public education, district education, and it worked when they went to school, and so why should we change gears? And I think that is a um, reasonable uh, question, uh, and I think there's a bit of fear of, well, what will you get with an alternative, and how is that all going to work out? Uh, and I think that is also a legitimate uh, fear. Um, but I think we can agree that for most kids of color in urban areas, it is profoundly not working. And so I think our attachment to equality and civil rights has to kind of trump whatever ideological views or, frankly, lack of courage that we have. Like, we're going to have to just jump into the deep end of the pool and try something else because it is so not working for 
uh, in very profoundly unequal ways. And so my hope is that rationality will triumph. That might be naive. Um, um, but also, you know, that political activism will triumph. I think that you saw that a little bit. De Blasio tried to throw out uh, the highest performing school in math in the state of New York. That was one of our schools. It didn't work out so well for him. And I do think that's because, you know, it's not, I don't think it's an everyday occurrence that 17,000 parents are willing to march across a bridge or 11,000 parents are willing to go to Albany to the seat of state power and express that this, don't take this alternative away from me. And so I, I think we are making progress, but it's frustratingly slow. How's that? <laughs> and how about on the high school? Question? On the high school, um, we uh, opened our first high school three years ago. Uh, we just opened our second one uh, this summer. Uh, the kids that I taught in first grade, I was both their reading teacher and their principal, are seniors this year. And, uh, you know, we, we produced uh, the average SAT scores were 1240, and not a single kid was below 1100. Uh, and so um, we are very, very hopeful uh, that um, we will be able to see radically different uh, outcomes than um, we have seen for that demographic in this country. Connor. Hi, Eva. Hi. I'm Rob Spidell, and my wife and I are supporters of AEI. And just want to say, above all, thank you so much for the public service that you have performed by creating this new model of education, and hope that you take it to every state, every county. Um, my question is, I read recently in the, in the Post that something between 5 and 15 percent of kids um, are diagnosed with dyslexia or other learning challenges. And how do you, at what point are you able to identify those kinds of problems and what can you do? I know I read Mission Possible and I know that you carve out extra time for people who, you know, who need it to keep up. But this, you know, these, some of these learning difficult, difficulties take another order of magnitude. So I'm just curious as to how you deal with that. Sure. So um, thank you. Uh, about 20% of our kids are special needs kids. And we've actually never failed to teach a child to read, ever. There have been times where I had my doubts. <laughs> and there were, you know, we didn't teach them to read right away. Um, but by third grade, every single kid is reading. Um, and we have plenty of kids who have dyslexia. It's pretty obvious fairly early on. Um, we have a different uh, program in reading, uh, partic particularly it's called Foundations for Kids We Identify. Uh, and we'll use, if that doesn't work, we'll try another program. And if that doesn't work, we'll try another program. Um, so in, for, in terms of identifying, do you have your own diagnostic staff, or do you use the NYC DOE special ed oh diagnosis? No, we try not to use the New York City. <laughs> so. uh, no, we have, um, we, we have uh, psycho ed evaluators who will do an evaluation for us. Uh, and uh, pretty efficient digitized assessment these days that you can use. We, we actually do them on an iPad, and they're uh, much faster than the old ones that took like 12 hours uh, for each kid. Um, but it's a lot, uh, it's a lot of um, shoe leather, meaning um, you've got to put your best people with those kids. It's not just about time. It's really about um, sophistication of exactly what the issue is 
And a lot of it is also motivation, meaning the kids decrease in self-confidence, and then they can't get it. Uh, and that interplay between the self-confidence, the low self-confidence, and the learning disability is a, is a pretty toxic combination if not properly handled. Uh, so we do. I think that we, we've been very successful there. I think the kids that, if there's any group of kids that we've been least successful with, and it's a very, very tiny percentage, it is severely emotionally disturbed children. It has been very challenging for us to um, deal with kids um, who, you know, have been deeply traumatized. Um, but we actually have uh, psychiatrists um, to try and help us uh, help those kids. Um, but the LD kids, it's slow and hard, and uh, you really have to pair the child with. Um, someone who has a really good relationship and can be inspiring to that child, but we, we've managed. Mm. Uh, Bill. Uh, you might, in, in answer to an earlier question, you brought up Bill de Blasio, and here's a man who aspires to be seen as the leading progressive politician in the country. I wonder if you could just expand a little more on his views toward charter schools and parental choice and your... Mm -hmm institutions in particular. I know people here would be interested. I mean... Oh, I, I forgot to say I'm Bill Evers. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, this may sound strange, but I share a lot in common with Bill de Blasio. I, you know, I, I do think there's a tale of two cities educationally. I do think that uh, there is you know, a level of injustice in the city, around the state of New York, around the country. I just think my solution to that problem educationally is very different from his. Um, his appears to be um, big government, one size fits all. To me, it's sort of a 1970s vision of um, government. Um, which doesn't seem to me incredibly successful. Um, so that's where, um, you know, we differ. I, I suppose we also differ. I, I really, I believe in management um, and showing up on time to <laughs> meetings and events and, and all of that kind of stuff. I just, I, I just, you know, I think it's really, important, you know, education is so important that it deserves to be a high performance organization. Just like, you know, any other sector, it's got to attract talent, it's got to invest resources, we've got to have, or educational organizations are amongst the most important organizations to be very, very well run. And, um, so, you know, we, we differ there. It's, it's been very difficult, as you know if you've read the book, uh, to function in the city at this very moment. Um, my elementary schools, uh, so our elementaries go K to four, and our middle schools go five to eight. Uh, I have been waiting now for 10 months for space um, for our middle schools. So these are among the highest performing elementary schools in the state of New York. And our kids don't have middle schools to go to, meaning the mayor won't give us the space, even though there are 112 chronically underutilized buildings that total 65,000 seats. And he has said publicly that he's the mayor of all children, district and public charters and yet we don't have our space. And, you know, it just, it's very frustrating. And by the way, oh, middle school is his thing. Do you guys remember that? That's like the missing link he wants to fix middle school. 
Uh, he also just appealed the pre-K decision. Isn't pre-K his thing? But he doesn't want us to have pre-K. So there are just he a lot of- appealed which decision when you say? Um, he, we won a lawsuit after, I can't remember, three years? I, it's hard to keep track of. Uh, we wanted to do pre-K just the way we do kindergarten. Uh, he wanted me to sign a contract that regulated nap time professional development, how many field trips the four-year-olds could go on. And I said, just like my kindergarten, state law doesn't give you the right to regulate that. And so I wouldn't sign his contract, so then he didn't pay us. And then uh, we brought him to court, and we just got, uh, in June, a unanimous decision, which is very unusual. Um, and the judges, I, I love this, they're, the judges said, their opinion was literally, all means all. Because the state law had given uh, SUNY, our authorizer, the right to regulate us. And so the court case came down to the meaning of the word all. And we knew the, word, the meaning of the word all before all this happened, <laughs> but we had to go through all that. Uh, he has one last appeal and he just made it uh, Friday, even though pre-K is his thing, right? Didn't everyone read that this is the pre-K mayor? So he's pre-K in a big government, one size fits all. He is not pre-K in such a way that parents get to choose where they send their kids. And the reason, you know, pre-K is important to us is for all of the educational reasons, but it goes back also to parent choice. Why shouldn't parents be able to kick the tires and decide which is the best pre-K program? And you all know that many of the pre-K programs, it's really warehousing of children. It is not of incredible educational value. Our pre-K program is magical. It is totally magical. And our parents want to go to our pre-K, but I had to shut the program down because he wouldn't pay us for it. I think I will win eventually, but these are just the battles we have to go through in order to just get from point A to point B. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Amanda Kramer Borden. Um, I worked for Eva six and seven years ago. Um, nice to see you. It's good to see you. Um, I recently started a principal training program in DC called School Leader Lab. Um, you've more, you and Success have more than achieved a lot of the big goals that, that I worked with you on um, five years ago. What's next? What is next? Uh, well, the Ed Institute is really a very important part of our mission, uh, really sharing not only the content and curriculum, but I think the, the professional development and all of the tools that um, teachers and educators need uh, to um, do right by kids. So that Say is... Say a little bit more, what is the Institute actually? Sure, the Ed Institute, uh, well, it's, it, uh, we're having its, uh, now has a physical manifestation. Uh, so um, in Hudson Yards on 41st and 10th Avenue, uh, we have a lab school, a K to eight lab school, and we have a, a training facility. Uh, the Ed Institute is really, I call it a school for schoolers. It is to teach people all aspects of schooling. Uh, if you take something as simple as procurement, uh, sourcing and logistics, it's actually really complicated uh, in schooling. Uh, and we have developed all sorts of ways to make that sourcing and logistics. If you saw my kidding abilities, you would be really impressed. Um, kits are where you, you know, you can't order supplies in America because everybody orders them in June and they don't arrive in most districts until November. But school starts the day after Labor Day or earlier. So that's sort of a big problem. So what you have to do if you don't want to fall into that trap is you, you have to kind of warehouse the stuff. You have to order it, warehouse it, and then get it to the schools. Uh, and so on any topic in schooling, um, we have uh, 
profound solutions to problems uh, that I think most educators face. Uh, and because we have the freedom to innovate, we've really thought about you know, what is the best way to do sourcing and logistics. Uh, what is the best way to, we do field trips every other week. We are transporting 15,500 kids, not transporting them as in buses, because we have the advantage of the subway, but how do you make sure that you have the EpiPen? And how do you make sure you have the asthma medication? How do you do all that for at scale for large numbers of kids? Uh, we have found solutions to just a range of schooling problems, and it is our intention to share that with the world. You might not want to take advantage of it, or you might make it better, we hope you do, um, but you can look in a centralized um, repository, we call it the Ed Institute Library, where you can log on and figure out how to solve schooling problems, and so, you know, we hope to be kind of the Google of education. How do, you, how do you figure out new ways of doing things so that other people can serve children um, better? And will this be run by success staff, or is this a separate entity? Um, right now, it is part of success. Uh, we do need to raise money for it because the sharing, uh, we have to pay for all of the, the stuff that we do. And as, if we can raise uh, the money for it, um, we'll go faster and put everything, make everything we can available for everyone who wants it. Now, and will there be actual programming and physical trainings too? There will be. Uh, and we already run something called the Ed Partnership program where we train middle school principals, uh, kindergarten teachers, superintendents, um, and we built the Ed Institute uh, in order to be able to train both internally and externally uh, and to have that attached to a lab school. So you can actually, you can train on, uh, proportionality and then see a success teacher uh, lead a discussion of that mathematical concept right then and there. Mm -hmm. uh, we also, um, you know, it's, we hope to make it state of the art technologically so that you can do a lot of distance learning for the adults. And in terms of growing success academic programs, five years out, how many kids would the goal be to have enrolled? Well, we're trying to get to 100 schools if we don't die of exhaustion. Um, and that would mean that we would be serving 50,000 kids. Uh, and so we, we would have to, bless you, we would have to open approximately, uh, you know, 50 more schools in the next uh, 10 years. And mm -hmm. that, that's, the plan. Uh, I'm not interested, though, in growth for growth's sake. I, I'm only interested in growing if we can do it with extraordinary, extraordinary quality. Uh, if we can't, then we're happy to pass the baton, Amanda, to you, and you can open up uh, and improve upon uh, the model. We really, you know, we see ourselves as trying to provide a model and a proof point that people can iterate and improve upon. Um, you know, we need as many solutions as quickly as possible. Uh, we feel the problem of educational inequity uh, urgently. Uh, every day that goes by is a day that a kid is sitting in a failing school where the child will not learn to read or do math at a high level, and um, we want to put an end to that as quickly as humanly possible. Mm. Hi, I'm Diane Pichet, a longtime fan of Eva and Success. Hi, Eva. <laughs> Hi, Diane. Uh, this is, my question um, is sort of a future-looking question, and that is that you will be graduating students from high school more and more and more as you grow and as they come up the pipeline. Um, what are your thoughts about 
higher education and where they're going to go and will they be successful and will they be indebted for the rest of their lives and you know, as you probably know there are huge quality issues uh, and equity issues in higher ed and there's a huge problem with student debt in this country and failure to graduate even in you know four six years even just getting a two-year degree. Um, a number of charters have started to look at that issue because they realize that it's not enough to just get kids into college, but you've got to get them through college. So I was wondering if you had plans for that, A, and then if you've thought big picture about you know, ways to systemically reform higher education like you're providing model for in elementary and secondary. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I mean, you're making obviously great points, and I'm sort of new to the world of higher education. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think the financial resources available for uh, kids that we're serving, it, it's a little mm. disheartening. Uh, you know, wouldn't it be a terribly cruel joke on kids to prepare them and then for them not to be able to afford to go? And so we stay up at night worrying about that uh, quite, a, quite a bit. Uh, and look, uh, my colleagues in the charter sector have much more experience at the college persistence um, part of it. We're kind of new to this world. Um, we did make some pretty different decisions than I think um, a lot of the pioneers in the charter movement. One of the reasons we started with K and one is because we felt so strongly that kindergartners, um, affluent kindergartners, have such an advantage over non-affluent kindergartners that you really just had to start. Uh, we'd like to start at pre-K if the mayor would let us, but um, you really have to start um, as early as possible so that you have a prayer of catching up. Uh, you know, if you, all the studies about uh, differences in vocabulary are, you know, 3,000 by the age of six, that's very, very challenging to over, overcome. But our strategy uh, to date has been, um, you know, 14 years of education, if we can get the pre-K in, and this emphasis on critical and creative thinking, as well as, frankly, um, independence. Independence of thought, but also independence of social experience. We, you know, we think that um, the impulse to micromanage the kids that has been pretty prevalent in the charter sector, we understand the reason for that. Um, and as I described here, we do that for attendance in elementary. Uh, you know, we don't for high school. The kids are going to have to get out of bed uh, without their parents, without us, and they're going to have to go to class. And if you don't really prepare kids for that level of independence, it's going to be very, very challenging uh, once kids get uh, to college. So in our high school model, it was very frightening, I have to say, at first. We, gave, we give the kids uh, two hours a day where they get to decide what they do, want to do. They can go and shoot hoops in the gym. They can go to the dance studio. You'll be shocked to learn that nobody decided to study. <laughs> nobody decided to study. And all the teachers wanted to take away the lab time. Let's turn it into homework detention. And we said, no, we're going to, those GPAs are going to be low. And kids are going to have to learn that you do make choices in life. And Maybe you need to play a little less basketball and spend a little more time hitting the books. But it actually takes tremendous restraint from the adults because our urge was to protect them and to save them from uh, not so good choices. And we really had to be restrained to say, nope, we're going to give you two hours. I mean, when you get to college, you spend far less time in class than out of class. So using that study time is going to be very, very important to their success. I wouldn't presume to have cracked the persistence nut in any way, shape, or form. But we're really thinking about independence at the elementary, middle, and high school level in order to um, help our kids. We also really believe in self-advocacy. 
So we have office hours in high school to really help the kids that you gotta draw down the resources of whatever institution you go to, and we're hoping that that puts the kids in good stead. Mm. But I'll have to talk to you in like four years and let you know uh, how, it, how it goes. <laughs> well, we're gonna have you back to talk about it. <laughs> Eva, I, I think we could sit here and pick your brains all day, uh, but it is 4.15, I wanna thank you for just a terrific conversation. I wanna encourage folks, um, to grab a copy of The Education of Eva Moskowitz, like Robert said, it really is just, it's a fun read and just a real look at, you know, what goes on the day-to-day -day work of, of New York City education and of charter schooling. And uh, thanks for all you do for so many students. Thank you, thanks for having me. Thanks.